started. Thank you all for coming to this, the first of, I believe, five winter squash grow along sessions. We're going to learn about the diversity of squash and Oren Martin is, of course, teaching. Um, thanks for joining on a Friday night. I know you have fun things to do, but um, we're going to put you in front of a Zoom meeting for a little while. First, let's do a few of those Zoom housekeeping items. Please note that you will be muted when you come into the session and we'll keep you that way until, um, well, pretty much throughout. You can always send your questions and comments through the Q&A function or through the chat and we'll be monitoring that throughout the session. Whatever we can't answer, we're gonna take note of and make sure that Oren discusses it at the end. If you would like to see what's being said verbally on the screen through ca closed captioning, then mouse down to the bottom of your, of your Zoom screen and look for a button that says live transcript. If you click the live transcript, you will be able to see what we're saying. This session is being recorded and we will send a link to the recording along with the presentation um, and any other resources that come up in the, in the meeting a day or two after the workshop. And if you need technical assistance on the call, please do a direct chat with Vanessa Ackerman, who is our Zoom hostess tonight. And now I turn it over to Oren Martin. Thanks, Delise. Um, let me just thank Delise and say she developed the slideshow tonight, so I appreciate that. And um, before we get going, I'd like to uh, uh, have a little land acknowledgement. Now, uh, I've written a longer piece entitled Reflections, Remembrances, and Respect on the Confluence of Geology, Geography, Climate, and People, but it's not quite edited for prime time yet. So I'll start the next squash thing off with it. It's about a three minute piece or something, but I have a little statement, a land acknowledgement. So I'll just read it. The UCSC Farm and Garden and the entire university itself operate on the unceded territorial lands of the Amamutsun tribal band. This land was wrongly taken from them and they were taken from their land to the missions at Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista. And as they now continue to reclaim their sovereignty and relearn their traditional ecological knowledge and management practices that sustain the landscapes and its natural resources for four to 8,000 years, we support them. So it, is with, so it is with respect to them and to the earth itself that we farm this land. Okay. Uh, you can get hold of them. Oh, let's go back to that slide again. Right. Uh, uh, you can access their uh, land trust uh, site and you can support them monetarily, but they also have many great learning days, field day, days and such. So, okay, let's go. Uh, this is about me. <laughs> uh, I'm Oren Martin. I work at the UCSC Farm and Garden, have for a uh, a good number of, actually I've been associated with it since 1972. I've been working there for 43 years. I teach gardening, orcharding, farming, uh, and uh, I uh, enjoy it. I teach to a diversity of audiences, uh, the general public via workshops, normally, and we'll be looking at our squash seedlings in the greenhouse and going out and look at the lay of the land. Uh, in the fall, we can do that again. Uh, I teach undergraduate students in classes and also uh, via a really robust internship program where they come 12 to 15 hours a week. Uh, and our base uh, platform anchor program is our apprentice program. We have a residential apprentice program uh, and that seems to fill my days. Uh, this event is brought to you by our affiliates group, the Friends of the Farm and Garden. And I would like to encourage you to become a member of the Friends of the Farm and Garden. They support us in oh so many ways. And if you support them, you will get a few perks. Uh, as you can see here, there are, if you're in the area, uh, there are some nurseries that will give you a discount. Um, you also uh, get a really nice quarterly newsletter chock full of horticultural information. Next slide, please. And uh, 
upcoming on May 1 and 2 will be a, our annual plant sale, which we unfortunately had to cancel last year. And if you become a member, you get early entry and a 10% uh, discount. Look for more information about our plant sale this year, which will be at the Cow Hay Barn. Barn. It'll be a low contact uh, affair. Um, and um, uh, it, the inventory as well will be up on the website shortly. Okay. But actually before, we can stay with this. So you get some perks. The friend, friends support us. But when you're paying your membership dues for the friends, what you're really doing, and I think what's probably, I hope is the most satisfying thing is you're supporting the work the staff of the farm and garden does in running the farm and the gardens. We have two gardens, an acre garden down at the farm and a four acre garden up below Merrill College. And you support us in teaching people uh, as we teach the rudiments of organic farming and gardening. Okay. Uh, so this is entitled a grow along. And as I said, at least what the heck's a grow along? And uh, she said things like this here. And so we're gonna have a number of sessions here um, and uh, check-ins um, and uh, uh, we'll just go back and forth. Uh, I, I will deliver content at each one, uh, but I would really like it to turn into a conversation, Q&A, office hours, if you will, on winter squash, yeah, but not maybe this one, but the next few could be on anything in terms of questions related to uh, gardening. And it kind of, in a way, in, in, in a shadowy way, I don't mean in a, in a sneaky, sketchy way, but, but it shadows uh, what we do with our apprentices. We'll usually start them off with a crop talk, uh, something like a lecture, but it's a little more kinetic and uh, shorter and more lively. And then we'll go out and engage in soil preparation for a crop. And then we'll seed or transplant, and then we'll take care of the crop. Well, this is uh, an attempt to follow a crop from seed to skillet. Uh, and uh, uh, the skillet part is critical and exciting and something to look forward to because we, we're hoping that it culminates in the fall in October or so with a big welcome back workshop at the Cow Hay Barn where we can display our wares, uh, have dishes to eat, talk squash, uh, talk cooking squash. Okay. Uh, upcoming events here. Uh, yeah, party, October 10th, sounds good. Day after John Lennon's birthday. So these are the, the dates and the topics of the grow along if, um, to, to make it clear what we're doing. Um, why winter squash? And I say, why the heck not? Um, and let's define terms here. And uh, uh, it's called winter squash. The old name for it was hard squash, referring to the alligator like tusk skin. Uh, but winter squash doesn't refer to the time of growing, that is spring, summer into fall, uh, but rather the time of consumption. Uh, it is a marvelous storage crop. Uh, to get into the details a little bit. Um, it's a crop that will grow well in just about all areas, uh, whether you're on the coastal strand as we are here in Santa Cruz where it's cool and foggy, uh, or if you're in the heat uh, of the Central Valley, or any other continental situation. Um, requires little labor in a comparative sense, it's relatively that way. Um, and uh, can I say this? Sure, I can say it. Um, you can either direct seed or transplant. We'll go into that more at the next session. Uh, and maybe, but maybe not, uh, you might not have to weed. You might have to weed or hoe once, but you might not even have to do that. There's a marvelous technique called the stale bed that farmers use where you work the ground in whatever fashion you're going to do, amend it in whatever fashion you're going to. Um, and then you irrigate it, stand back. It's called a stale bed for about 10 days, two weeks. When you disturb the soil and you add oxygen to the soil and you expose the soil to sunlight, it stimulates weed seeds in the weed seed uh, bank and they will germinate. So you wait for this to happen over the course of a couple of weeks, and then you knock down the weeds, and then you plant or seed, and that gives you a serious jump on the weeds. Uh, and with 
a winter squash, they're such a luxuriant plant with big leaves that they're also referred to as a smother crop. They will shade the ground and suppress other weeds. Um, so if you have a weedy area and you're wondering how to control it, one possibility would be to grow winter squash in it this summer. Uh, stores well with no cooler needed. Uh, uh, yeah, at about 50, 55 degrees and similar humidity. Uh, in dark, it will, uh, winter squash will score, st store a couple months, six months. There's one pumpkin type called Jaredale, which is an edible pumpkin and really rich, that stores up to a year. Um, and in fact, storing them in the refrigerator can actually cause them to deteriorate in terms of their uh, sweetness and, and flavor. Um, grows well in most uh, soil, uh, resist, uh, tolerates pests and diseases. Yeah, it's not a particularly uh, diseasey crop. We'll talk more again next time. It is prone to powdery mildew. Uh, uh, the best solution is uh, to not water them overhead, to use some sort of drip tape or, or tea tape like that. Um, and there are resistant varieties. Um, if, you, uh, if you see a variety in a catalog and it has capitalized PMT afterwards, that means it's powdery mildew tolerant. Not immune, somewhat resistant, somewhat tolerant. So you can go with uh, those uh, varieties. Um, grows well in most soil types. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's akin to a dahlias, the a beautiful cut flower or, or sunflowers, which is to say, uh, inherently, they like a rich, deep, fertile soil. And yet, they'll give you something, and something pretty good in almost any soil. So you can grow it in a, uh, in fact, I had a friend off of Meter Street and he had a big patch and we decided to grow winter squash there. It, it was a sandy, a wretched, sivvy, sandy soil. And we, we did winter squash there and we amended the hills with some compost, but it wasn't a very good soil. And we got a pretty prodigious uh, yield. Um, uh, it's, uh, because you leave the soil, because you're covering the soil with the foliage of the plants, and you're leaving it relatively undisturbed. It really aids soil health and quality. As mentioned, it's a good smother crop to decrease weed uh, uh, pressure. Okay, next slide. Um, let's see, I'm actually gonna read a little piece here as an intro before we take this up, a uh, page or so if I might. Uh, winter squash, AKA hard squash, referring to its tough alligator-like skin, which is what gives it its ability to store without refrigeration for months. How many months? Well, it's that classic instructor's dodge. It depends. Two to six months in general, some less, six months and longer, some more. Uh, if we go left or right on the screen here, the PIPO types, are the shortest storing, maybe two or three months. Uh, Moshata types, intermediate, maybe up to five months. The maximas are big. Pipo means large melon, Moshata means musky, and maxima means large. The maxima types um, are uh, amazing in their storage ability. Uh, easy five, five, six months left. Okay, back to the texture. So it's a thick skin uh, that is along with proper curing. And that is they need to be field cured as the, after the vines have has died down and you cut, not pull the fruit off the vine, maybe turn them a couple, three times, and then further cured in a dark, dry location. Um, that and making sure you leave a two, three inch stem, cut, don't pull again. Uh, a stem with any item, whether it's an apple or an orange, uh, uh, a pepper or a winter squash is simply a buffer between the environment and rot organisms and the item. Uh, so you always want to leave a, leave a stem. So um, another thing about the curing is it, it evaporates some of the water content and that enables the squash to store uh, longer. Um, so winter squash, yeah, the more hale and hearty cousin to summer squash without the need to harvest almost daily. What comes to mind with winter squash is that it's, uh, it packs a punch in a gentle manner, of course, vis-a-vis -vis nutrition, high in vitamins, A, C, B vitamins, particularly B6, high in antioxidants in the form of beta carotene, orange yellow things are that way. Um, and uh, it, it 
helps to boost the immune system. Um, what comes to mind a lot of times when I think about uh, winter squash is cold and wet winter days and nights. Y'all remember when it used to rain in the winter in California, right? And a hearty, thick winter squash based soup laced with the bullhorn peppers you're gonna grow and ro roast and freeze this summer. So crack open a winter squash, thaw those roasted bell bullhorn bell peppers, and you bring a little bit of August, September sunshine to the sometimes dreary, bleary days of January and February. It's food for the body. Winter squash is a food substance. Uh, so additionally, uh, as you're putting the soup on the table, if you put a bouquet of daffodils, narcissus, tulips, narcissus, and anemones on the table, squash is food for the body, flowers, food for the spirit and the soul. If you do that, well, it's right as rain. You all remember when it used to rain in California, right? Okay, let's dive into it. So uh, let's go back to the previous slide, actually. Uh, uh, we're talking about members of the cucurbitaceae family, which is a whole lot of fun to say, the cucumber family, the melon family, gourds, cucumbers, melons, squashes, summer and winter are the principal vegetables in this family. Uh, tonight, we're just talking about uh, winter squash. Um, so there are three principal species or types, and they are uh, enumerated here. The Pipo types, the Moshata types, and the Ma Maxima types. Um, let's chat Pipo types for a minute here. Uh, uh, they are the smallest, they are the lightest, and when I say light, light I mean light in weight as well as light in taste. And I don't mean that in a pejorative manner. They're, they're light. They're just not beefy, as it were. Um, they are thin-skinned. In fact, with the delicata types, the whole thing can be eaten: skin, seeds, flesh, and all. Um, and as their skin is thin, they have the store, shortest storage life: one, two, maybe three uh, months. Uh, the principal types that are in under the Pipo species would be, uh, well, in the old days in the 70s when we first started growing them, we referred to them as the dumps and the delis. That would be the variety sweet dumpling, which is kind of a small turban shaped thing, ivory white uh, skin with green stripes and beautiful orange on the inside, nice flesh, nice sweetness. Um, so that's the dumps, sweet dumpling, and uh, it's hard to find that variety these days, but Baker Creek Seed has it. Uh, and, the, and the delis would be delicata, which is an oblong, oh, it's a picture here. Uh, you see it uh, like that. It's very light, a little bit sweet, and just cooks real quickly because of the uh, low density of flesh and the thin skin. What we like to do is, is simply cut coins and put it on a cookie sheet, Base it with whatever you like. Maybe as little as 20, certainly 30 minutes. It's ready to pop in your mouth like that. Uh, so the dumps and deli, sweet dumpling, and the delicata types of which there are quite a number of different varieties we'll get to a little later on. Um, and acorns. Hmm. Let me see if I can say something charitable about acorn squash here. Um, beautiful but often disappointing. I have some recommendations for you. Uh, one of the issues with the acorn squash is, is there isn't much there there. There isn't much substance to the flesh. Uh, and they are probably the shortest storing of all uh, the winter squash. I would eat them within one, definitely two months of harvest uh, or they seriously uh, deteriorate. So the Pipo types. Um, Moshada, again, which means musky, and it's kind of hmm, like that. They were probably the sweetest. Uh, the, the main uh, Moshada type is, uh, uh, are the uh, various, and there are quite a host of butternut uh, squashes. Uh, there are others, uh, and we'll go over the butternuts later. Uh, Maxima, they're the largest, uh, typified by the Hubbard, which can be uh, the, a beautiful teardrop. Uh, shape, but it's 20 pounds plus and a monster vine that will need, you know, at least 100 square feet to grow on. Um, uh, the Hubbards, as you see, uh, 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 I mean, the, uh, the turban squash, as you see here on the left, is uh, uh, 
edible, but mostly used as an ornament. And the kabochas, kabocha means winter squash, I believe, in Japanese. Uh, they the driest, the flakiest, flaky is good in this case, uh, the flakiest and the meatiest of all the squashes. Uh, and uh, they're maybe my favorite uh, class. Pumpkins, pumpkin, as Ella Fitzgerald once sang, it don't mean a thing. And she said, if it don't got the swing, but um, pumpkin is not a botanical term. There are things called pumpkins in all three of these species. There are things that look like pumpkins, the jack-o'-lanterns and such, and there are things that don't look like pumpkins and are really good uh, food stuff like that. Okay, let's move on a little bit. Um, okay, uh, as I was mentioning, uh, there are issues with uh, uh, acorn uh, type squashes. I, I'm not a big fan. Uh, they just uh, don't have much oomph uh, like that. Uh, but Johnny Select Seed, as usual, comes to the rescue here. They have, and many of the varieties they have, they have in fact bred themselves um, quite a few I'm gonna say decent to really good uh, uh, acorn types. Uh, honey bear is cute and small. Tuffy is maybe the best tasting of all theirs in terms of the combination of texture and sugar. Autumn Delight, I have to confess, I've never grown. Uh, Tip Top um, has good, better, better texture than sugar. And a new one that they bred, and they bred it in conjunction with Cornell University, which is big into the breeding, plant breeding in general, but particularly winter squashes, Starry Night. Starry Night is the one pictured here in the middle on the bottom here. And it's beautiful, although I like Van Gogh's rendition a little bit better. Uh, but it is bigger than your average uh, uh, acorn type and is denser in its flesh than your average uh, acorn type. Uh, and it keeps much longer. It'll keep three, maybe four months. Uh, on the right bottom picture here is Delicata. Again, it's no fuss, no muss. It's probably one of the earliest uh, winter squashes to mature. Uh, doesn't need any curing off the vine. It can be eaten right off the vine. And as I mentioned, it's, it's light and sweet and easy to cook up, uh, uh, but doesn't store particularly well. So next slide. Um, let's see, uh, let me just run through some really good seed companies for you in terms of, uh, we'll have more specificity shortly. Uh, good companies that have good varieties of winter squash. The aforementioned Johnny's, and I like it and I don't like it, but more and more as time goes on, it's kind of my one-stop shop. And I kind of like, yeah, I shouldn't be. I used to do business for 37 different companies, but it is. Um, the only thing I would fault it on is it used to have until about five, six, seven years ago, a really great selection of uh, perennial flowers. And now it has a smattering of, but, but the vegetable, uh, the quality and the quantity of the selections with vegetables par excellence. Their annual cut flowers are good and even improving more as time time goes on. Uh, territorial, um, I like I like a lot. Uh, it's a small family-owned operation up in Oregon, and I like it. And it's good for us here on the coast in Santa Cruz, cool coastal Mediterranean climate, because they specialize. Because they're in a cool valley, uh, they specialize in. Uh, varieties, particularly varieties of warm season crops that do well either in short season areas, high altitude short season areas, or cool uh, climates. And they specialize in these uh, uh, people types. Uh, so I mentioned Delicata, it should be more properly the Delicatas. And that is, uh, we have a listing here, Honey Boat, which is a, this actually, okay, I'm gonna nail these folks. They did not let their honey boat, the upper left uh, uh, slide uh, photo here, they did not let their honey boat mature enough on the vine. It's not dark enough. It, it gets to be a rich, creamy brown uh, on the uh, exterior. And it is as advertised, uh, sweeter than your average delicata. Bush delicata is good. And uh, all of the people types, the acorns and the delicatas are good because they have 
relatively speaking, uh, short, compact vines. You can probably just simply devote as little as four, maybe six square feet to each plant and pull it off in a small garden. Um, and the bush delicata is even more compact than that. I have to say the bush delicata leads the pack in terms of compactness, but does not lead the pack in terms of taste and texture. It's okay. Uh, mashed potatoes, uh, great dance craze in the 60s. Uh, uh, but yeah, it's kind of a, I feel about, this is the white uh, lower left here, uh, squash, you see, I, I feel about, about mashed potatoes, it's look, the same way I feel about white pumpkins. It's just not right. But its taste and texture is a lot like mashed potatoes. And mashed potatoes with the butter on it like that. Uh, Reno is another really good tasty um, uh, uh, acorn type, uh, unfortunately out of stock. Thelma Sanders is an old throwback. Uh, Seed Savers Ch Exchange has it. Um, and uh, it too has the texture of, well, a lot of people say it tastes and has a texture of sweet potatoes. And, eh, that's nothing to trifle with. Um, okay, we could move on a little bit. Um, the moshata types, uh, mostly uh, it's butternuts and there are many butternuts. And this is supposed to be the sweetest of all classes of, of, of uh, winter squash but I'm begging to differ, or it doesn't seem so anymore. Uh, don't wanna sound like an old guy, you, know, hey, you kids get off my lawn, but uh, it seems to me that whether it's uh, places like Whole Foods or New Leaf or Staff of Life in town here or standard supermarkets, it seems like the quality of winter squash in the markets, I don't mean farmer's markets, I mean in the supermarkets, uh, has declined. Uh, and uh, that is sounding, it's not rotten or anything. It's just like the taste isn't there anymore. And I suspect there are several reasons for this. It could be the varieties, and this applies very much to the Moshada uh, butternut types. Um, uh, you read a lot of the varietal descriptions in the catalog, and they'll say things like productive. High yields, easy to market, but you don't read anything about taste and texture. And as a catalog reader, you need to read between the lines. Uh, it doesn't say, like, if you're growing a bell pepper, and it doesn't say crunchy, juicy, thick walled, and sweet, you're not interested. It says things like mild flavor. That's a euphemism for it. It don't taste too good like that. So that's an issue. Uh, with the uh, particularly the butternut types on the market, but also uh, uh, retailer pressures on the grower. That is to say, as a winter squash is growing along, it's you know pretty boring looking, and then it starts to develop size, of course, and that's exciting. And then its color comes up last, and it'll get whatever color it's supposed to be, and it'll be I'm going to say somewhat vibrant. But that's not fully mature. You need to get let it go a little further on the vine till it becomes kind of dull. And growers are pressured to harvest it at the more cosmetically pleasing stage. And as a result, you haven't got your full development of sugars and starches. And I think um, the taste uh, suffers. And uh, so that, and then just breeding for looks, breeding for size, uh, uh, breeding for uh, uh, productivity, uh, the butternut types have taken uh, uh, quite a hit. Uh, again, uh, who comes to the rescue? Uh, uh, largely our friends at Johnny's, but there are other companies. Um, the trend and, it, and, and, and first plant breeders, because of pressure from growers, resisted this forever. Uh, the trend with butternut squashes, I'm gonna shout out butternut types, is down. I don't mean that in a negative, I mean smaller. Uh, and with butternuts, whatever the variety, the smaller ones are the better ones, both texture, taste, and sugar. Now they will not store as long as the bigger ones. And that's true across the board with winter squashes, bigger, tougher skin, longer storage. Uh, 
A um, couple not not notable ones, uh, Butter Baby here and Butterscotch, both from Johnny's. Other people have them. Butterscotch is actually an introduction that was uh, just uh, recently released, bred as a collaboration between Johnny's Seed Company and, 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 and Cornell. It's a mid-sized thing. Um, do we have the row seven slide here? Please. There you go. Um, okay, smaller is better. Smaller is trendy. The reason that growers resisted for years and did not want breeders to have breed a smaller squash is because they thought there would be consumer resistance. They were dead wrong, dead wrong in public. People love smaller squash, particularly these uh, baby butternut types. Um, thing. And as the size comes down, it seems one of the byproducts of the breeding is that the, the texture, the taste, the intensity, it's more intense, it's more, more better, uh, like that. Um, and uh, the, the top of the heap is this. This is a variety called romantic name, 898, um, which apparently was the trial plot it was grown in from row seven seeds, which is another QC name. Apparently it's, they keep their seeds in row seven in the warehouse that they keep it in. Uh, this is a marvelous small new seed company. It is a collaboration between uh, uh, famous chef uh, Dan Barber and brilliant uh, plant breeder from Cornell, uh, Michael Mazorek, and a seedsman, uh, Matthew Gofar. And it came about by happenstance, serendipity. Uh, they're all at an event, some shishi upscale event, uh, where one of the dishes being cooked by Dan Barber and served was butternut squash. And they were, you know, I don't know, maybe they're out back having a smoke or something. Yeah, I wouldn't do that. Um, uh, but they got the talking and uh, Barber was like, can't you just breed a better butternut uh, a squash? And the plant breeder, Muzarek said, huh, what, taste? They don't breed for taste. Uh, we read for all these other factors. Don't you do a taste test? And yeah, and Barbara said, how do you cook it? Well, we usually microwave. Or maybe we put a whole big glob of it in a big uh, uh, pan and we put some water in there and we bake it on, on uh, low heat. And Barbara just about passed out. No, no, no. And he, he cooked some up for him, uh, just flat out just baked it on a cookie sheet at real high heat. And what happens with these butternuts in general, and particularly with this uh, uh, 898, is uh, it, it, it actually caramelizes. We get like blackened and caramelized, like caramelized onions. And it's, uh, it's, I'm starting to salivate just talking about it here. Uh, so that's the good news. Uh, it's the best uh, of all the uh, butternuts. I think arguably certainly in the top three, four, five of my favorite winter squashes overall. All right, good news. Uh, oh, uh, other good news about, about that? It's a compact vine and the smaller the squash is, generally the more fruit you get. You can get 14, 15 fruit, half pound, or it actually will fit in the palm of your hand, three quarter pound off this 898. And it like other compact and small fruit types can easily be trellised uh, so you can have more and less space and they don't sprawl. The other thing about trellising squash is because they are prone to powdery mildew, um, you get the vines and the foliage up off the ground and spread out, exposed to sunlight and air circulation. They can somewhat lessen the instance of mildew. Um, uh, and it's just striking. You'll see in a, a few slides here, we have some trellises uh, with hanging squash. It's a, it's a wild, wild thing. So, uh, uh, okay, that's all the good news. What's the bad news? You can hardly ever get the seed. This is a really small seed company. It's a side hustle for all these gentlemen. And I assume they are gentle men. Um, um, and uh, uh, this one, they've touted it so well, it sells out like that. So there's none available this year, but I would order in November next year. Uh, and if you can get it, it it's, it's just a phenomenal tree. Um, it is close to another squash that I think Barbara, uh, that uh, Missouri uh, also uh, bred uh, called honey nut or sometimes climbing honey nut and Renee's seeds carries it. Uh, but this is the top of the heap here. Okay. 
Um, the maxima types, uh, these are maxima means big, large, and they are big, they are big and bold. Um, the um, probably the prototypical one in that regard is the old heirloom Hubbard squash can be in excess of uh, 20 pounds and can be not only difficult to cut open, but downright dangerous. I've known people who with a cleaver have sliced tendons in their hand. Okay, this isn't gonna get you points for presentation, but an easy way to cut open, crack open, really tough winter squash, take it outside and drop it from about four feet on the driveway a couple times. Now it will not be the most symmetrical of presentations, but it does the trick, no fuss, no muss. And if you're having it's Thanksgiving, you're having extended friends and family over, hopefully we'll be able to do this this next go around. You got some, you know, kind of bored kids, seven, eight, nine, maybe even 10 years old. Say, hey kid, take the squash out on the sidewalk and throw it on the ground a few times, bring it back in. And they look at you like, are you kidding me? And they do, and then you hook them in to help and you prep like that. So the Maxima types, thick skin, long storage, uh, big one, yeah. Uh, the uh, uh, Johnny's again has some uh, smaller ones, which are just uh, most uh, excellent. Um, uh, uh, in this category are what are called, not butternut, but buttercup types. The first two listed here, bonbon, and it's true. It's as sweet as a bonbon. It's really sweet, but it's also got heft to the texture. Uh, and Burgess Buttercup are two quintessential uh, buttercup types. Burgess is kind of my favorite squash, uh, and it's because I it was the first squash I winter squash I ever grew. But it's really good, uh, uh, dry, flaky, dense, sweet, rich, stores forever, beautiful to look at. Um, uh, and it's from the 1930s or so. A bonbon is a an improved one, and it's maybe equally as good like that. Uh, red curry uh, uh, is a kind of a small Hubbard uh, teardrop uh, shape, a really good uh, north. Georgia Roaster, yikes. It's here in the lower left. It can be two, three feet long. It can be a 20 foot vine, not for your small landholder, of course, like that. Um, you might only get a cup three squash off it, uh, but got plenty of poundage like that. Uh, and, but so this variety, North Georgia Roaster, and another variety is actually in that Moshada group um, called Tahitian Melon Squash are uh, just uh, different than any other squash I ever had, you know, oblong banana types. Um, and uh, they are uh, amazingly dense, amazingly sweet, but what's, they're almost like a uh, papaya. Well, I don't mean that in terms of taste, but I mean in terms of their behavior. So you have a oblong squash, it's two feet long. You cut a chunk to cook, uh, roast it, Take the squash and put it in the fridge and it will seal over. It's kind of a mucinolaginous seal, much like the pie does and it won't rot. And you can run it for a number of weeks out of your refrigerator once you've cut into it. Um, and uh, the best of them all is this Tahitian melon squash. We have a slide coming up later. It looks like a, a banana squash on steroids or something or a butternut squash on steroids. It can be twisty, curvy and three feet long. Uh, uh, I, I, I grew them in the 70s and I hadn't seen them for a while. And then I, Baker Creek Seed, as always, if you want an heirloom, they, them and Seed Savers Exchange, they, they come through in the flying color. But just recently, and again, for those of you living in the Santa Cruz area, the nurseries are now stocking little three inch pots of pretty good sized um, uh, winter squash. And San Lorenzo Garden Center has this Tahitian melon squash. And boy, I, you better get down there before I buy them all up, um, like that. Um, uh, Sunshine, winter sweet, and cha cha are new varieties of the classic Japanese kabocha squash. Kabocha just means squash in Japanese. And the Japanese have a love affair with squash. It didn't originate there, it was brought in the 1500 by the Portuguese, uh, but they have taken it on. And they uh, use in soups, sushi, tempuras, every which way you can. Um, and uh, uh, they are uh, par excellence in terms of uh, 
uh, performance, uh, you get a moderate amount of, uh, you know, it would be a maybe one to three pound uh, uh, squash, maybe get a half a dozen or so per vine. Uh, they're not super compact vines, but they're not super spreaders either like that. Um, they are beautiful to look at and they are really scrumptious uh, to eat. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. Uh, two of my favorite companies, period, drop the mic, uh, uh, but definitely those that carry heirlooms uh, and exclusively so are Seed Savers Exchange in Iowa and uh, the aforementioned Baker Creek Seed. Um, and they have a host of rival selections. Um, so uh, these are some from uh, uh, Seed Savers, uh, Anna Swartz is another one that has uh, the texture and the taste in the direction of sweet potatoes. The Guatemalan blue is similar to the candy roaster or the uh, Tahitian uh, squat, long banana type, uh, beautiful uh, uh, dull blue color on the outside. Uh, Queensland blue. Uh, Queensland blue is represented by the middle top uh, acorn shape uh, slide uh, photo here. It's rather big, can be easily in excess of 10 pounds, maybe up to 20 pounds. Uh, it's rather hard and difficult to cut open. Uh, uh, and it is uh, uh, amazing. I never, it didn't strike me visually. I never grew it. And then a number of years ago, I was at a, a potluck and a former apprentice, uh, uh, Paul Richardson uh, brought in a 15, 20 pound Queensland blue squash. Uh, he had towels around it because it was piping hot. He had cut the top off, taken the uh, innards out, uh, cooked it, pureed it, uh, and then made this to die for mixed uh, stuffing with dried fruits and nuts in it like that. And uh, I became a, a member of the of the flock here. Uh, it's, it's really spectacular. Um, skipping down the list here, uh, two other ones from uh, uh, Sea Savers uh, that are dull looking, lower right, uh, but good tasting, uh, Sibley and Silver Bell. And uh, you should never ask, uh, say, an apple grower or a rose grower or a winter squash grower, what's your favorite? because there's a list of, but Sibley's up there, top five, um, in terms of, uh, again, that, that trifecta of, of uh, intensity or density, uh, sugar, and uh, uh, texture. Uh, and it is, uh, as an aside, uh, the staff at Seed Savers Exchange boasted hand down the best winter squash. Silver Bell is right on its heel, heels but, and, and real good. Okay, next slide. Uh, here's the aforementioned uh, Tahitian squash uh, uh, on the left here, and that's a small one. Um, uh, and then uh, Baker Creek Seeds carries a variety of kabocha called just kabocha, and it is um, not the prettiest looking thing, but it may be the best tasting of all the kabochas, and it's pretty big, five, eight pounds like that. Um, uh, they also carry um, the, a good Bye, pumpkin, the New England sugar. Uh, that and um, cinnamon girl, I think are my two favorite kind of mid-sized small uh, pumpkins for pie. Uh, okay, next. Uh, I always like to give a shout out to Renee Shepard, Renee Seeds, she's local, she's a friend. She is amazing in every respect. Uh, a, a quality, quality, quality seed company, and that dirty dog her. She gets to travel the world, seeing what they've got in Italy and Hungary and Southeast Asia to bring back seeds to sell. Uh, and uh, uh, it's bad English, but there, she ain't never had nothing in her catalog that was no good. Uh, all her stuff is great. A uh, couple here: uh, the climbing honey nut, uh, uh, and you see amenable to trellising. Um, and it's, like I said, just on the heel, it's heel, heels of the uh, 898 uh, squash, really good, really sweet. Rouge Vive des Temps, pardon my French, is basically the Cinderella pumpkin, as you see on the right here. And hey, 
you got to have that. And it's, it, 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 it's an incredible plan, a long, wide sprawler. And it'll throw five, four, five, six uh, pumpkins. And whether you like it or not, some will be small, some will be medium, and some will be ginormous. And that's just the way it rolls like that. But it also has a really good interior. It's really good in thick soups and purees. Um, and uh, it's like a striking ornamental. So next slide. Yeah, here's a, a top recommendations of pumpkin-like things. Um, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, New England sugar pie and the uh, the cinnamon girl. Jaredale is uh, a, a monster, uh, uh, and uh, it's probably the longest keeping of all winter squashes. Certainly six to eight months, maybe up to a year, and it is rich and it is dense. And, Really good like that. Um, the two, uh, the Marina de Chioggia and the Musque de Provence um, are uh, similar uh, in terms of uh, being meaty and good. And also they're represented by the slide in the top left and top right. Uh, and just uh, uh, amazing to, to look at. The uh, Musque de Provence has that kind of a burnt cinnamon sienna color to it. Uh, uh, these are uh, very, very vigorous vines uh, with very big 8, 10, 12, 15 pound fruit. Uh, and I'll give you maybe two to four fruit. Again, the general rule is the smaller the fruit size, the greater the number per plant and the more compact and shorter the vines. Alrighty. Uh, let me also just say again that Pumpkin doesn't mean anything botanically. Uh, it's, it's just a generic term. In, in Europe, they use pumpkin for a lot of edible squashes. In this country, we think of it more for ornamental jack-o'-lanterns and for pumpkin pie. Um, okay, onward. Um, space in your yard. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, there are some excellent compact types, but they're not ahead of lettuce. Uh, they do take up uh, space. Uh, uh, so uh, be forewarned, I guess you could say. Uh, let me, I got a list here. Let me run off so, again to summarize some good bush, compact or uh, short vine types. Uh, again, the dumps in the deli, sweet dumpling and delicata. Um, all of the smaller butternuts um, and uh, uh, there's a variety again that uh, uh, Territorial has uh, a beautiful striking uh, kind of more orange than gold but gold nugget. Uh, it's basically a, a bush buttercup and it's got a, a gold orange exterior and a flaming orange interior. Um, and it gives you a pretty good amount of fruit, eight to 10 per vine. Uh, the uh, buttercup types, the aforementioned bone bone and Burgess are also uh, compact uh, vines. Uh, I love that uh, Burgess buttercup. And as I said, it's from the uh, uh, 1930s and it's been around and for good reason. So think about it, but the idea of trellising is viable. Uh, for the mid and the small size uh, squashes. Uh, you can use uh, any gauge, you know, three or four inch gauge wire, like hog wire. Um, they now have at the various feed stores in towns, uh, what they call alternately hog paneling or horse paneling. And it's four inch rigid spot welded uh, wire, four inch squares, comes in various lengths, four, six, eight, ten 10 feet. If you get some of the ones that are four feet or six feet, you can make a perfectly good A-frame to grow your squash up. Um, seed saving, oh, available sun, as always, you need a minimum of six to eight hours of direct sunlight uh, to grow anything really. Uh, although I will say this, one of the things that winter squash has going for it is its enormous photosynthetic leaf surface. And I have seen it grow and produce reasonably well in sketchy sun shade areas. High shade better than dense shade. 
Um, again, uh, seed saving, I'm, I'm not going to say anything about it other than, you know, I wouldn't. Uh, it is, uh, it could be fun. Uh, you need to uh, isolate uh, plants and it's a quite a, quite a, you have time in your hands, it's quite an undertaking. Uh, but I don't find it something that's practical for the home grower to do for a variety of reasons. Um, um, bush versus vine, container versus ground. We'll talk about this. You can either direct seed winter squash or put out transplants. In general, I'm going to say this about those, except for root crops, which is mandated because they have a tap root that can't be transplanted. Except for root crops, I generally recommend transplants over direct seeding. Uh, and that is because uh, you've got a jump start on the weeds with a sizable seedling. Uh, and you have to do less weeding. It's just easy to take care of. And in terms of the matter of predation, birds, slugs, snails, etc. If you've got a seed and it comes up a dicot with two leaves and you lose one, you've lost half your photosynthetic surface. You put out a bigger transplant, you have a, a three, four inch pot, uh, a winter squash, maybe it's got three, four, five leaves, you lose one or two, you've still got some grow power there. Um, so, uh, and, and, and if you were to analyze it, I suspect uh, the amount of time it took, say, take a crop like onions, to direct seed onions versus to do transplants. All the watering, weeding, and fussing that you need to do, I think transplants would win the day, and I recommend it, but you could uh, direct seed. Um, uh, okay, next slide. This must be the Half Moon Bay uh, pumpkin fest, right? Uh, uh, I think I covered most of this. Uh, pest and disease, I'll cover next time. It's not a particularly diseasey crop and it's not particularly prone to pests. Uh, there are two, as I mentioned, the powdery mildew and uh, the uh, uh, beautiful but uh, dreaded uh, cucumber beetle or the dibrotica beetle or the 12 spotted western cucumber beetle as it's variously called. Um, and that beetle can be a problem, not just that it munches flowers and foliage and fruit, uh, but it also uh, carries a bacterial wilt that can cause plant collapse. Uh, but, and, and, and let me say this about disease in general. I don't mean to do a downer here, but if the con environmental conditions are right for the disease, the disease will be rife. Ain't no two ways about it. So what can you do? Um, you can look for resistant varieties, whatever the disease is, and there are some. And uh, you can also be extremely careful with your watering practices. Uh, with vegetables, flowers, and definitely with fruit trees, almost all diseases are caused by a period of moisture on the foliage. So if you're not watering overhead, but you're watering with drip tape or tea tape, you're going to prevent wet foliage, unless of course you live along the coast. But like I said, if the conditions are right for the disease, the disease will be rife, green and berry. Uh, let's pause here for a minute before we go on and talk. It says soil pH test. So one, you get a soil test. There are two ways to evaluate your soil, quantitative and qualitative means. Um, we talked a little bit uh, previously in the soil session about qualitative means. Quantitative means involve a soil lab test. And you want to know what you're, don't, I do not recommend using the uh, uh, pH test you can get at the garden center there. They're ballpark accurate. And the scale for pH is a logarithmic scale. So six is not one more than five, but 10. And seven is not two more than five, but a hundred times. So you need to be fairly precise. This is best ascertained through a lab test. Uh, and what is the significance of pH? In a nutshell, it's basically uh, an the desired pH across the board for most flowers and vegetables is roughly 6.0 to 7.0. Uh, 6.2 to 6.8 might be more the sweet spot as it were. Um, and that is just the pH at which macro and micronutrients are most available. As you move out of that down in pH to acidic or up to alkaline, there's a restriction of nutrients. You can look in any textbook and you'll see these torpedo graphs, and it'll show it very graphically. You're in the sweet spot, phosphorus, you get too acid or too alkaline, it declines. So it's important to know what your pH is. It's pretty cookbook once you know it, how to adjust it. Um, so 
uh, and the lab will give you a recommendation. Uh, okay, let's go to the next slide. Uh, how cool is this? Kudos to Elise for finding these images. I especially like the one atop. Come on through the door, come on into the garden, but I suspect this is a hard hat area. Wow, that is cool. That's a big honking butternut squash hanging there. Uh, one of the best uh, examples of a structure for squash was uh, must have been 25, 30 years ago up at Camp Joy in, in, in uh, Boulder Creek. They had an old uh, metal uh, geodesic geodesic kids, you know, climbing structure. The kids had grown, they weren't that age anymore, but they're still around, you know, maybe 10, 12, 13 years old. So they grew winter squash all over. The kids would crawl in there in the middle of the summer in the heat of the day, and who knows what they did. That's cool. All right, next slide. Uh, I like this squash so much, I guess we run the slide again. Okay, we can move on. <laughs> um, okay, uh, uh, I'm gonna throw down the gauntlet. It's a reference to in the medieval times, knights used to wear uh, gloves that were made of metal. And when they wanted to challenge someone, they would throw their glove at that individual's feet, a challenge, a throwdown. I don't believe in all that violence and stuff, but it is a bit of a throwdown here. Let's grow squash. You grow it, I'll grow it. We'll compare notes. We'll have a fest in the fall, as I said, the squash of Palooza, as it were. Uh, but you better get moving on getting seed. Uh, as is the case with the pandemic times we're in, gardening is trending. Everybody's running out of everything everywhere. In fact, I'm not sure if it's still true, but about a month ago, Seed Savers Exchange was so back up, they stopped taking orders. I believe they're back on again. Um, but uh, Johnny has a presently a very good supply. So does territorial, mostly uh, like that. Uh, and I might add that I have been pleasantly surprised by my recent visits to the local garden centers. There are some killer varieties of winter squash, uh, many too, uh, on the rack. So uh, trot on down to uh, the garden company, North End of Mission, uh, locally owned, uh, or San Lorenzo downtown, or uh, other uh, garden centers around uh, your area. and Get those squash seeds now. Um, I'm not gonna do much right now on starting, uh, uh, as I mentioned, we'll, we'll cover that in greater detail uh, next time. Um, and I would not, I'm speaking from 37 degree north parallel Santa Cruz, uh, 800 feet above uh, sea level, three miles inland uh, and thereabouts. I would not seed, direct seed my winter squash now. Some years it's safe in the middle of April, more often the first of May. It is a chilly, cool spring. Uh, I would wait. It is a big seed, it is a soft seed, it is prone to rot. Don't you do it, don't you do it, don't you break your heart. Okay, uh, you could start your transplants now and put them out in three or four weeks. Uh, okay, next slide. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, we're having a plant sale May. Uh, you can check it out on the CASPIS, that's Center for Agroecology and Sustainable Food Systems, a terrible acronym, CASPIS. Um, uh, good entity, bad acronym. Uh, 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 the inventory for the plant sale and the rules of the road, as it were, it's going to be a low contact thing. Uh, we're asking people to sign up in certain time slots. Uh, uh, but we have quite a few, as you can see, pumpkins and, and winter squash. Uh, and I'm really excited and a little envious, and I might have to sneak down there early because I've never grown the Shokichi Green Mini Kabocha. But boy, uh, I'm going to grab a one or two and try them out. So uh, it's a pretty good lineup here. Uh, of these, I highly recommend the Burgess Buttercup. Like I said, I think it's one of my favorite. The Sunshine Kabocha is yeah, bright orange and uh, all, all kinds of sweetness and goodness. Uh, uh, yeah, get yourself one of those Cinderella pumpkins, Rouge Vite de Tomps. Um, Howden is just kind of a oblong, good handled uh, punk and punkin. Um, uh, and a lot of uh, punk punkin people uh, evaluate a pumpkin by, of course, its color and its, its size and its shape, but the handle, what kind of handle does it have? Is it long? Is it curved? This and that. So those are some selections we'll be having in the winter squash pumpkin department, May 1, May 2 at the Cow Hay Barn. Okay, please, next slide. Oh, okay, I get to shut up. You get to ask questions.
we have had a few questions. Let me throw them at you. When planting the three sisters, that would be squash, beans, and corn, mm. what order should you plant them in and how often should they be rotated? Um, okay, let me, I was gonna do a little spiel on the three sisters. Winter squash is the squash involved. So corn, but I don't mean your average sweet corn. I mean, field corn, flower corn, dent corn, flint corn, popcorn, if you will. Uh, really tall, 10, 12, 15 foot corn, those three things. Uh, and uh, climbing beans uh, and winter squash. Uh, uh, Mesoamerican, traditional, cultural, agricultural, symbolic set of crops that then spread both north, east, and west to other native peoples uh, in uh, Central and North America. Uh, and it's a great companion trifactor. Um, the tall, sturdy corn, again, not your wimpy little hybrid sweet corn, uh, is a trellis for the vining beans to go up. Um, and the beans fix nitrogen for the very nitrogen needy corn. So there's a good symbiosis there, works both ways. Um, and the winter squash occupies space, covers the ground, shields the soil, protects the soil, prevents surface evaporation like that. So uh, in terms of planting them, um, let's see, um, uh, you direct seed both corn and beans. So I would do that simultaneously. And again, you need to use the right varieties. You need to use vigorous flint dent flower corn or popcorn. You need to use some of the marvelous old vigorous climbing uh, beans, uh, uh, whether they're fresh or dry. Um, but plant them, direct seed them simultaneously. In this area, about May 1 is when you have 60 degree soil temperature on average, about six inches down, and it's safe to go with your direct seeded uh, warm season crops uh, or wherever you live. That's it. It's usually about May 1 here. Maybe delayed this year. And hold back with the winter squash. Let the other two sisters come up and get established. And this is a space extensive operation. You need a good amount of space uh, like that. Uh, but it is a, a time honored cultural and agricultural. Endeavor. Okay, space. You you mentioned it, and somebody wanted to know how much space is needed for a squash plant. Uh, employing that instructor's dodge. Oh. It depends. It depends. <laughs> hey, that's a good question. Don't you just hate it when people answer that way? Um, uh, the bush types and the compact vines. Um, okay. Here's what we do at the farm and garden. In the field at the farm, we grow them in single rows. And it almost doesn't matter what it is. The spacing in row is two to three feet between plants. We probably have four to six feet between rows. And it's that would be considered extremely intensive, but it works. As I said, you don't go out there much. You don't need to go out there much during the season. Uh, and at that spacing, I don't think you can get out there um, like that. So, uh, but as little as a three or four foot area for the more bush and compact types would work if they're on the ground. And they could be even, like with the, the mini uh, butternuts, I'll put them a foot apart if they're gonna be trellised up uh, like that. The bigger ones, the Maxima types, uh, they're gonna need maybe as much as 100 square feet. So you just need to figure out how much space you have. Um, uh, if you've got plenty of ground, and again, it doesn't have to be the highest quality ground. Uh, you can go to the more rambunctious vines. And then there's that slide about space saving where you can grow them in a hay bale and spill them out on the lawn and so yeah, I, up, a, up a trellis. You, you already spoke to that, uh, right? Hay bale culture in that regard. <laughs> You've done it? I have. I do it all the time. My yard's just a hay bale mess. <laughs> I uh, see hay bales around culture around town, never try it myself. Uh, cool. I, uh, all right, another right. question. So um, let's go back to the three sisters. This um, person that is dying to know the answer wants to know how much time between planting the squash and establishing the corn and the beans. Um, I would uh, wait until the squash 
I mean, I'm sorry, the corn is, I'm going to say, thigh to waist high. The beans are just starting to climb up, it, something like that. Probably be, yeah, 30 days in. So you might have to pot up your uh, winter squash into even a gallon uh, to hold it. Okay. Let so me just say, it is an amazing construct. And having done it, and I'm thinking of doing it again this, this year. Um, it, it's cumbersome. <laughs> it's clunky, but it's sweet, so to speak. Um, and I'm, I'm doing it in lamentably this last year uh, for a period of four or five months. I was the only person in at Chadwick Garden taking care of things. Spent most of my time scrambling and watering, scrambling and watering the 594 fruit trees that we have or had. I actually pulled the plug on one block of stone fruit, principally peaches, uh, and they died. Well, they actually <laughs> didn't all die, but they mostly died. So it's a, a, a set of terraces, and I'm thinking of doing the three sisters in them. Uh, I'm going to plant uh, the, the beans at the base of the scaffold of the dead trees and the corn and the squash will be scattered about. So I'll report back as we progress in our grow along. Maybe I'll have some photos for you. Okay, you're going to be in the grow along. Perfect. If, the, if they'll let me in. I will let you in. Um, somebody wants to know about gophers and can you put a winter squash in a gopher basket? Uh, heard it. You might think about it. Uh, gophers like winter squash. They like them pretty much at every stage. Well, I haven't seen any seeds yet, but seedling to, you know, you're just about to pull that beautiful maxima of winter squash off the vine, zoop, it's gone like that. So uh, yeah, you can do it. I'd, I'd either, I don't like the, the gopher baskets you purchase. Uh, uh, Gophers Limited, Thomas Whitman has a great stainless steel one. It's really pricey, but really great, but really pricey, uh, different sizes. Uh, you get the fold out ones, they're okay. Um, probably, I think the best bet is to make your own. You can just buy the gopher wire, and cut those wire cutters and fashion your own. But I'd make it pretty sizable, you know, 20, 24 inches by 20, 24 inches. Uh, but if you live in a situation where you know you have a lot of gopher pressure, sandy meadow, or you're just not willing, or maybe you're not a good gopher trapper, um, I'd, I'd recommend thinking about it with winter squash. Uh, uh, but you also should think about learning how to trap. Okay. Oren, I just have to tell you that once I had the biggest pumpkin ever, and I was so proud of it, and my husband would come out and pat it every day. One day it deflated because the gopher got inside the exactly. pumpkin from the from the soil and ate it from the inside out. I'm laughing, I shouldn't. Be. <laughs> it was the exact same experience. We used to grow our pumpkins in a patch down by the the barn on the farm, and then when we had our fall festival. Hey, the kids could go out and harvest themselves. We stopped doing that. Um, we stopped doing it principally because one year we found a darn black widow under every pumpkin. It's like nah. So now we harvest them and bring them up out there. But we had that experience too, where they're just the innards were gutted by the gophers, like boy, insult to injury. Yeah. Ever. So we're heading into a drought year, and somebody wants to know how they are they sustainable to grow in terms of water consumption. Um, as I mentioned, across the board, they're an undemanding crop in a sense. Um, and you see all that foliage, you see all that biomass. Yeah, of course they need water, but um, they need about an inch of water a week, uh, which is not a lot. Uh, I wouldn't classify them as a water intensive crop and or you can grow them with a leaner, meaner water regime. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, they actually can be, uh, I think I mentioned, dry farm. That is to maybe water once or twice to get them started and then not. This works best in areas like ours on the coast, where you get 20 plus inches of rain, maybe over into uh, San Jose area. Uh, and it really works even better if you have a clay soil, which retains moisture, or even if you have a sandy soil, but the subsoil is, is a little more uh, clay, because the winter squash will send its roots down and out four feet and more. Um, but about one inch a week would be standard uh, operating procedure, as it were, for watering on winter squash. And you can determine how much one inch uh, 
is by simply taking whatever your watering device is, if it's a sprinkler of this type or that type, if it's tea tape or drip line, put, turn it on, put a container under it and see how long it takes to get an inch. At the farm, we use these rain gauges under the tea tape or the drip tape. And then we know it takes that long and <clears throat> we apply that about once a week uh, and it works. In Santa Cruz, there's a thing called ETO, evapotranspiration. And we lose through surface and plant evaporation and transpiration about one inch of water a week from the soil. So we replace it with one inch of water a week. If you live in the inland or if we have a heat stretch, the ETO will be higher and you have to water more food. Right. Um, we wanted to know about cross-pollination, whether it affects the flavor or texture of the, of the fruit that year, and if it could cross with other cucurbits. The answer is uh, it, it, cross-pollination will have no effect on this year's crop. It will, would you say, were you to save the seed? Uh, that's one of the reasons you, you need to isolate uh, uh, Gosh, if you're uh, saving seed. Uh, it's a whole procedure. Uh, uh, now, Elise, is Kelly going to do a seed saving thing in the fall? Maybe? We certainly hope so. Yeah. yeah. Um, Kelly down at the farm is uh, into a uh, concept called seed sovereignty, grow your own. Um, and I, I bet she could be convinced to go through the rigors of how to save seed from uh, winter squash or summer squash. Um, but it has no effect on this year's crop. Okay, and does it cross with other Positive. Okay. Okay. Um, and can you, are there any squashes, some winter squashes that will do well in shade? Um, it depends, of course, on how much shade you've got. Uh, if you have sub the six, eight hours of direct sunlight you need, say maybe four plus five, you might be able to sneak by with some of the smaller framed squashes, compact vines, uh, the delicatas, uh, the sweet dumpling, maybe acorns and baby butternuts. I don't rightly know, but there's one way to find out. <laughs> Again, it needs to be high shade. It can't be low dense shade. So I'm sure we're gonna get into this next time when we get to planting, but advantages to planting in hills. Are there any problems with that, like um, introducing disease because they're crowded? Yeah. Um, winter squash is going to be crowded and it will crowd everything else in the vicinity. And it, it, you could put one 30 feet apart from another. And if again, if the conditions are right for the disease, the disease will be right. Um, you can use resistant varieties, of course. Um, so what, restate the question again. Advantages to planting in hills. Uh, that's just another route you can go. Uh, you can have a, a, a mound or a hill that will accentuate drainage, which is good. Uh, it makes so you can concentrate your addition of compost and or fertilizer if you choose to use it. Um, and uh, maybe a two, three foot gentle mound like that. Uh, you can put, probably end up with two or three plants per mound, maybe six, 10 feet between mounds. It's just one route to go. Okay. Um, that's it for the questions I've seen. Let's look at the homework assignment for those who are going to do the grow along. All right. I uh, want to read them their homework, Elise. <laughs> sure. So what we'd like to do is meet with you um, every one to two months um, through the growing season. We will learn from each other. We will learn from Oren. Um, we will provide a link to an email address that you can send uh, pictures or questions during the times that we're not meeting. And as Oren said, if we don't have enough squash questions, you can bring, bring other garden questions. And um, Oren will be available to us for all kinds of answers. Flowers, fruits, veggies, bring it. But for now, the, the, research, the, the homework is to figure out what you want to grow and procure the plant material, either as a seed or a start. Um, check your check your yard, measure the hours of sun in the place where you think you're going to plant your squash. And that means you 
you take a day and you stay at home and you go out every hour and you write down, you know, was it full sun, part sun, dappled shade, um, and understand. Health day. Yeah, it'll be a it'll be a squash health day <laughs> for your mental health. We all need one now and then. Um, if you're growing it in the ground or in a raised bed, you might want to add some uh, compost to to the grow, growing medium. Medium, and if you're if you're growing in a wine barrel or a very large container, um, you're going to want to get that set up and ready to go. You had a half wine barrel and a 20 gallon and or a 20 gallon plastic pot work pretty well for the compact vine types. And if you're going to get one of the smaller types, then uh, because you have comp you know, not so much space and you want to grow them up, um, then you need to build that trellis. And like Lauren said, uh, it needs to be pretty, pretty strong because they're, they're heavy. It, it does. And yet uh, I've grown, we use this product called Horta Nova Flower Knitting, uh, H-O-R-T-O-A, Horta Nova, H-O-R-T-A-N-O-V-A, must be time for dinner. Um, uh, and you can get it at uh, Peaceful Valley Farm Supply, Johnny's, many other purveyors. It comes in big rolls. It's, it's, it's a pretty beefy plastic trellis with four inch squares. We drive T posts and we use zip ties to really get it taut. And um, a couple, three years ago and subsequently, uh, I've been growing the baby butternuts on it. And I've even grown some really heavy crops of Romano pole beans that get and even scarlet runner beans, which get 10, 12 feet tall. It's, it's got amazing ability to hold fruit. Now, I wouldn't grow a really big fruit on, but you could grow those moderate and small fruit around. Horta Nova flower. And it's great. We use it horizontally to support our flowers. So they have straight stems. We use it for peas, beans, things like that. And I have to say that we have in the past um, created a sling out of a nylon stocking for a heavy hanging pumpkin. <laughs> you can do all kinds of stuff, but we'll talk about that when we get there and our plants start weighing us down. Yeah. We, we do have one person, Wendy is here from a different state. She's not telling me yet what state. Oh, good guy. Yeah, you can't tease. Uh, she's in Tennessee. Does that change her timing? Uh, yes, the answer is I haven't a clue. I've been through Tennessee and that's it. And the distant past. Um, uh, don't put either direct direct seeding or transplanting. Don't put your winter squash out or any other warm season crop until soil temperatures average about 60 degrees. You can get a really cheap seven, eight, ten dollar uh, soil probe at local hardware stores or garden centers. But when it's 60 degrees on average for a number of days in a row, uh, down four or six inches, safe to plant. When is that in Tennessee? I don't know. How would you find out? Go to the garden center? Uh, I bet you. Any, any good garden <laughs> people would know your local ag extension offices, uh, other good gardeners in the area. Uh, locals. Ooh, May 6th is the last frost date. What's that? May 6th is the last frost date in her area. Two or three weeks after the last frost date before I direct seeded or transplanted the winter squash. There you go. Okay. Mid to late May. I'm going to send out to everyone on this call in the chat uh, a, a link to an evaluation. We are always trying to improve what we're doing and we want to hear back from you. So if you can take five minutes, it's really short, really sweet. Just a little survey to find out um, how the class went for you. And here's some other things that are coming up. We talked about the plant sale coming on the 1st and the 2nd of May, if you're in the area. We have someone from uh, India on the call and somebody from Tennessee. That's pretty, pretty cool. Um, the second part of this, the grow along, this would be the planting part where we learn about hilling up and who knows what we're going to put into that one. Um, that's going to happen May 12th. May 20th is something called the Strawberry and Justice Festival. That's um, uh, a good like social responsibility and agricultural no, normally it comes in person and with strawberry shortcake, but I suspect not this year. <laughs> oh, that would be so good. 
And then on the 9th, we're having our annual poetry in the garden. It's not in the garden, but we will have a little video of the garden. And we're going to have some uh, uh, local and renowned poets reading reading pieces and maybe a little music as well. So that's fun. These are all free. And if you're in the area, come to the, the virtual one, but come in person the following year. Of yeah. all the things that we have at the farm and garden, it's just the most dynamically enchanting. I love it. And some really darn good local poets um, and a range uh, 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 of, of poets, age, gender, you name it, styles. It's, it's a really magical event. And uh, it, the good news is that we'll be able to receive many more people will be able to attend than could fit into the little space we had it in before, but it is really different to be on the property. Yeah, I guess the upside of Zoom is worldwide accessibility. That's it. And then uh, Oren is gonna be teaching again, caring for citrus. This is one of our most popular classes. His fruit tree work is it's world famous. And so yeah, we we're here with samples, but I, we won't be able to. Sign up for that soon and make sure you log on early for it because it might fill up. And we want to thank you all for being on the call. We cannot do the work without your help. Um, in the past, we have, we have uh, charged money for these workshops. And this year we're doing them for free um, because they're virtual. I, I, uh, I might comment that this very day I was taking care of those very fruit trees there. I was finishing fertilizing and mulching. They're in bloom. Oh, that's lovely. I've put a little link that you can uh, make a contribution or a donation if you'd like to donate directly to CASFIS, which is different than joining the Friends of the Farm and Garden. That was the link I put in earlier. And with that, we're going to send this presentation, this recorded class, and um, another resource document that is um, full of information. We're going to send it out to everybody, and we're going to make sure that you all have an email to respond with your information, your questions during the month, um, and photos would be nice as well. And we'll um, we'll see you hopefully next time. Okay. Uh, have something for you folks. Stay calm. Garden on. Garden <laughs> not cancel. Honor the 10,000 years on the planet that we've been farming. Going for a bike ride. See you all soon. Thanks. Oren, thank you so much. Yeah.